So, first of all, introduce yourself. Hiya. My name is Gary Harkins. I work here at the Bridgeton Community Learning Campus and my job is learning officer. Uh, essentially, my job here is to make the place busy again post-COVID. Uh, so my adult learning classes, get them up and running, get people back out, get their confidence back up, you know, get them back into the centre, meeting and re-engaging with other people and breaking down isolation and things like that. So, so that's my role. So you are really one of the people who are rebuilding communities? I would like to think so. Right, you know, yeah. it's, like, it's part of but a job, really, yeah. The reason I ask that is because, as we know, uh, the the whole communities, Bridgeton and Dalmarnock, and indeed other parts of the East End, have changed so much over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, 20 years, that the old communities have kind of broken down. And... Mm -hmm. There's a need to rebuild with all the people who've come to live here since, is that is that right? I would say so. Uh, I think if you look at the maybe even the example of Domarnock, uh, Domarnock in itself was a was a, a real established community. Um, then there was the introduction of the Athletes Village, which um, in some ways was it was good in terms of the infrastructure of the of the area, you know, there was there was a lot of derelict land. Uh, but but that was, was created as part of the Commonwealth Games and the legacy. That, that those properties were handed over to, to local people. Uh, that, in some ways, I understand it created a bit of divide, a bit of a them in those situation. So that I don't think is ever conducive with, with a harmonious community, if you like. However, I, I think that people are blended in. And, and you're right, we've got lots of new people that have moved into the area. You know, we've got a, 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 a kind of high proportion of asylum seeker refugees have moved into the area. I think it's added a bit of culture, personally, I like it. Um, so no, so it's changed the kind of a demographic of the whole area. Would be fair to say. It's an interesting because we're now well nearly ten years on from all that, and that's I mean it's a it's a it's it's a small time in you know in the big picture, but it's actually you know things begin to take root, do they? After that, after ten years, I think so. I think you know people you know you, you know any walk of life people are often reluctant to change uh and particularly if it has some you know if it affects them directly in a very personal way uh but i think now that people have you know settled down and i think post covid covid that nobody ever predicted that of course so you know we never you know to think back they will live through that would be a strange experience so it's a strange experience for everyone so i think now people are just finding their feet and people are just glad that's over and maybe people are making more of an effort now to think, you know, that previously they took things for granted. I would say now maybe that's not the case and people value what they have. And, and our community is a big part of that. So you yourself will have seen these changes firsthand because you grew up uh, you grew up around here. Tell us, tell us about your circumstances then, what you... Yeah, well, I was actually born, I was actually born in, in the house. My mother had a fear of hospitals, so I was actually born in the house. Um, a few years ago now, and yeah, and so I was christened in a local church, as were my siblings, I was the youngest of three, and so for the first 18 months of my life I spent here in Bridgeton. Then the family moved to um, the Parkhead area, slightly further east, and we stayed there for, for most of my, my life. Um, so what was it like growing up in Parkhead? Growing up in Parkhead, it was quite an experience. Uh, the, the place where I grew up was a, it was a small part of Parkhead. It's called Lilybank. You know, it sounds very you know quaint, Lilybank. Uh, it was so bad that the BBC made a documentary about the place, and uh, it became quite notorious in terms of poverty, in terms of you know usual kind of a lack of employment opportunities and things like that. So, you know, on reflection, you probably you you would. You know, we'd probably say that must have been quite a rough upbringing, but when you when you know nothing else, then I wouldn't say my heart, my childhood was, was in any way unhappy. It was what it was, and if you don't know any different, then then there's nothing to compare it against. So, so in that respect, it was absolutely fine with that. All the while, bringing because uh, my mother brought but the three children up herself, and my mother was was known as a hawker. And a hawker was somebody who would trade in second-hand clothes, buying and selling second-hand clothes. And just round the corner from here in Muslin Street, my mother had a second-hand clothes sale room. And so she used to sell second-hand clothes to local people. So she was well-known in the area. And uh, and I always felt kind of, you know, whilst I'd left Bridgeton, you know, all those years ago, there was still a strong connection there. 
and even you know I had an uncle who passed away, and I was I was asked to do the eulogy at the, the church there and what have you. So so there's a bit of a connection still there with with, you know, with the family and the wider community. And I've always worked in the area, so I, you know I know lots of people here, and I certainly feel very much part of it. Um, I'm trying to think how to kind of uh, how to frame this question. What gets lost when they pull down properties? There's been a, quite a lot of demolition, <clears throat> just straightforward, you know, tenements just being wiped off the face of the yeah. earth. And indeed, Lily Bank, I think, the same thing happened in the end, didn't it? Well, partly. They partly demolished Lily Bank and they've replaced it with more modern houses, so it's kind of a half and half. But I would say, you know, that, that's not exclusive to the East End. Across the whole of Glasgow, uh, to their shame, the councils uh, pulled down lots of Victorian old buildings, red sandstone buildings. And, you know, when you look at the West End of Glasgow, that, that kind of survived that call, if you like. But they were always privately owned. Uh, so for me, there was always a sense of community that was demolished along with the physical buildings. And b because of that, then there's a, there's a disconnect. You know, when you start to, to split families up, communities up, you know, then, then again, as I said earlier, people don't like change. And I felt that... You know, lots of good old fashioned traditional tenement buildings, which were a real feature of Glasgow. And I feel we've lost something there. I really do. And and again back in the days, and I know people speak, you know, through misty eyed kind of a, a historical, you know, oh, it was great, it was this and that. No, there was lots of poverty. There was I mean, one of the things about Bridgeton, again not in common with, with many parts of Glasgow, there was a there was a pub in every corner. You know, but it makes you a kebab shop in every corner now, you know, but but back in the day it was a pub. And and you know, and you know, kind of a the old kind of a gender stereotypes that the men would would go to the pub every weekend and sometimes on a Friday they'd bring the wages home to the wife, sometimes they wouldn't, you know. So there was a, a real drinking culture back then. Mm. And people probably drink just as much more as as much now, you're probably just confined to the house now because of this lack of smoking facilities and all that kind of a thing. But but the whole community has changed. I think the, the, the kind of a, the landscape, physical landscape has changed and people's habits changed. So so I think they've moved on, like, like most places, I would say. Yeah, do you, I mean, hope springs eternal, they say. I mean, do you, do you I mean, you're actively engaged in, in the process, but do you have, you know, high hopes, as it were, for, for what happens in the next 10 years? Well, I'm ever the optim optimist, yes, and I do have high hopes. Uh, I work in here and I see people coming through the door here wanting to do something about their lives. It's not just, I mean, people, when I see someone walking through that door, we, we work in a, a, an industry that's outcome obsessed uh, and then it's usually outcomes are measured by qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. For me, the biggest outcome is somebody coming through the door. And it's important that we come through that door because the, they want to make a change in their life. Now, that could be that they want to learn something that maybe head, head towards employability, or they might just want to come in and meet somebody and meet some friends and make new friends. And and I feel that, that given the volume of people who come through that door, it, it tells me that, 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 that people want to make a, a change themselves. So, so no, I, I feel heartened by that. I feel you know, confident that, that that's the way forward. Yeah, I've heard that expressed before, that they're actually getting, if, if somebody walks through the door, that's a massive, massive step in the right direction. Absolutely, is. it takes a lot of confidence, you know, people... Yeah, it takes, people, lot, takes people, courage. People, takes, it takes real courage, people take it for granted, but if you're stuck, you know, looking at four walls and have been, particularly during COVID, mm. people's confidence went to pot, you know, and, and some people like, you know, lost a lot, they lack how to communicate properly and... I'm not saying that they became, you know, you know, ignorant or anything like that, but, but the confidence went. And so to have people re-engage and say that there is a world out there and they're not in isolation and there's many, many like-minded people. And I think as a, as a community here, particularly part of the centre, we play, play a role in bringing those people back together. And obviously we can't, can't go backwards. It doesn't, life doesn't work like that. So one has to move forwards with whatever, whatever tools one has. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and, and we do that through many ways, you know, we, we do that through, you know, you know, I know that, that certainly during COVID and, and things like that, that you know, that the, the kind of a people, lack of people's digital skills became very apparent, 
But there was a big concerted effort by many organisations, you know, housing sector, etc., to engage with people through that technology. And through that, people started to, to re-engage. And, and we see evidence of that here just now, you know, people, people the, the kind of older generation, uh, probably include myself in that now, but, you know, people have, have started to buy into that and they see the importance of it. And, and not, not just in the local communities, but beyond, you know. So they're reaching out there, I think, you know, and I think that's probably one plus factor of, of the, the kind of a COVID period, if you like. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The, just to, go back, to take you back to Lilybank itself, I mean, and you mentioned the whole business of a misty-eyed nostalgia and all that kind of stuff, which mm-hmm. is, one has to acknowledge plays a big part in Glasgow's sense of itself. <laughs> it certainly does, yes. Uh, I mean, the housing was pretty poor, was it not? The actual buildings and so on. It, it was. It was really poor, and they went through a, a kind of Lilybank, they went through a regeneration programme of renovating all the properties, um, to a very poor standards. Yeah, and, they yeah, didn't, and, yeah and never they, really solved the problem. It never solved the problem, if anything, it exacerbated the problem. And, and again, we, we found ourselves in a situation where people were being what we called decanted on a temporary basis to another house, whilst their house was been renovated. And for some people, that would maybe last six weeks. For some people, it lasted months. You know, the programme falling behind schedule, poor workmanship, you know, a range of issues associated with that. And again, in terms of how the, a, a cohesive community spirit, that's not conducive to that. So it, it created a number of problems, and 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 it, and it brought down a lot of issues of you know a lot of issues of trust as well. Because you like to think that if the council at the time are taking over and managing a program of um, perceived improvements, mm-hmm. when the opposite actually happens, then naturally there's going to be a bit of disconnect. So, um, so that and, was yeah, bank, and, yeah, yeah, and then people get disillusioned and they get kind of uh, negative about all sorts of other things as well. Completely, you it's know, a bit of a I, spiral. Yeah, it was a spiral because during that process there was a series of kind of a tenants associations and council meetings and and it became quite personal, and quite abusive, and and again, you know, it led to high tensions within the community. So, so that was a real, you know, and and and, and it was. I was talked off with the BBC documentary. We had a, a lady who'd come come along and pretended to be, uh, I don't know if you know the story, come along and pretended yeah. to be Keith and Michael and him was. Mm. She pretended to be a kind of a local person, but all the while she was making friendships, but all the while behind people's backs. Yeah. She was, you know. It's a notorious film, and I don't think anybody would make a film like that today. No, well, 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 sadly, you know, we see things like the scheme in places like that, which was part of, uh, I think, the Channel 4 programme in Kilmarnock, that was based in Kilmarnock. And again, you know, people were, the, 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 you know, were, were led to believe that this was going to be a good thing. It became a bit of a goldfish bowl, mm-hmm. you know, looking That's in. That's true, and, actually, I've forgotten that. So it was uh, another poor... So, example. Yes, people get exploited and so on. But it's very difficult, the spiral that you were talking about, once that starts, it's really quite hard to stop, isn't it? For, for uh, all concerned, from the community, from the, the yeah. council, from the whatever, yeah. whoever has a kind of a stake in it. Well, it is, and how do you hold these things? Yeah, you, know, how yeah. do you, you know, it really does, and it, it really takes off. And, and once people become embroiled in it, as I said before, when it starts to impact, impact in people's lives and their homes, you know, if you're infiltrating people's homes like that, then, then how 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 much worse can it get? So that so the trust, the massive trust issues there. Yeah, that's. I think I think I don't think I think that's great actually, Gary. I don't think we need any. I think that's terrific. You've really you've really put your finger on some key issues.